Dear Lord, thank you for this time here. We're going to read a little bit out of the book of James, and we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, rapture and how Jesus plays his part in, uh, in that and uh, the second coming. So thank you for opening our mind, ears, eyes, and heart and giving me wisdom. And we believe that, that you've given us this word so we can understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so. Amen. Let's go look at that. So James is a very interesting book, and uh, I happened to have watched the last James Bond movie, and I can't, couldn't help but wonder, <clears throat> besides the fact that, you know, they made James Bond into a martyr, and it was a very much of like a, you know, you know, die to save everybody. But the book of James starts out like this. James a bond servant of God. And I just wonder if the writer, Ian Fleming, you know, didn't take that and go, James Bond, hmm, servant of the king. You know what I mean? Like, and come up with, right, the king of England. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is like the salutation to the 12 tribes who are abroad. Greetings, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you, we did this when we prayed, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you ask, God will give it. But he must ask in faith without any doubting for one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So it matters having faith, but you have to believe. And, and there's a, a, I remember a, in the New Testament, a time where a man asks, uh, Lord, help my unbelief. Well, that's even faith going, I don't have enough faith, but you have enough faith to give me faith, right? <clears throat> So we're going to jump ahead a little, then we're going to jump back and kiss myself, as James Brown would say. <laughs> Sorry. I just... Every now and then I flip on that song, I feel good, and then, and then, and then, and then, because our words, really, listen, our words matter. And we can speak out blessings and curses out of this same mouth. We have to learn to tame this tongue, to bridle it. Okay. Faith without works is dead. Now, I want you to think back to Abraham for a little bit, right? Because even though Abraham was justified by faith, correct? The only way we can see it is by his actions, correct? So we see he did things where he had little faith. Oh, saying Sarah is uh, Sarai, and then Sarah, this is my sister, lacking in faith, right? But then we see other times moving to certain places when he was told to and uh, doing certain things like going out as a superhero to save Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and only for them not to appreciate it really. And, uh, uh, and then uh, of course with the whole Isaac scenario, we see his faith acted out. So the funny thing is your good deeds can never save you. But your good deeds, your behavior, proves your faith. So here we go. What use is it, my brethren, this is James talking, the half-brother of Jesus, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, it is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. So what basically, and then he goes on to talk about Abraham and how he, that was proven with Isaac. And Isaac, and God said to him, um, well, you know what, let me read it. 
but you are willing to recognize your foolish fellow that faith without works is dead or faith without works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, faith was perfected and the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned or counted to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, not, you know, then he goes on to Rahab. And, and um, you know, I, I, I can't disagree with James because he's a, an author and he's in the Bible. But Abraham was definitely justified by faith and before he showed the works. But the works produce increased faith and it's like it becomes a circle but it's it doesn't start with works it starts with faith so <clears throat> interesting i'm reading that and i don't know why this wasn't what we're talking about in church at calvary church in jupiter farms but i was thinking you know i used to give and uh, i served in a food pantry i shot deer and gave them venison and and uh, i had you know I, I had a lot more money uh, then i had no debt and uh, I gave money to, gosh, Gospel for Asia, Christian Children's Fund, Voice of the Martyrs, Food for the Poor, Samaritan's Purse. And I really haven't done that so much. Uh, I made a and Dunklin Christian Men's Christian Drug Rehab. And I started thinking, you know, there's some people in our town, some people I've given therapy into our town here who could who could use some money. And uh, I felt like that around Christmas, I was supposed to do something. And I don't know, I got kind of excited. Oh, you know, my son's coming to visit and it's going to be fun and all that. And I, and I kind of uh, pushed that aside now. And, I, and I, I'm like, okay, I could still go buy them a gift card and, and do something like that. And, and to you, uh, you should be doing something for the community or for others. And not just the community, everybody who's fine, like, and it benefits you like literally donating to somebody. And, and I don't know where this comes in with giving money to the homeless man who may spend it on drugs or alcohol or just foolishness. Uh, that That's an individual by individual, moment by moment thing. You gotta just go, dear God, uh, is it better for me to give it to an organization like the Methodist Church that helps feed people in the town? Or is it better to go make someone sandwiches? Okay, so let's jump back now. So we were reading about um, being double-minded. So you have to believe and you have to walk in faith. For the sun rises with scorching wind and withers the grass and its flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed so that the rich man in the midst of pursuit and his pursuits will fade away. And blessed is a man who perseveres under the trial for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lusts. And, and you could probably add their desires, uh, lethargy even. And uh, I think about, you know, a lot of young people, teenagers, I mean, and I said that to you before, seize the day. Uh, you know, you, 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 I, I sometimes kid around and say, I'll have plenty of time to sleep when I'm dead. Well, I won't really be sleeping. I'd be dead and then I won't know I'm dead and then I'll be with the Lord or I'll be raptured, right? So, but, you know, there's a time for a nap, for a power nap, or there's a time to, to, if you're not feeling so well, to maybe stay in bed a little longer. But, but basically what he's getting at here is, is don't let the fleshly desire to, to like, uh, sexual or, or overeating or even sleeping or, you know, this stuff overtake us. Then when lust has con conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be 
a kind of first fruits among his creatures. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That's why this was on my mind. We did this in Sunday school with the children. We made a stress ball, and I wrote on it, 1 James 19, which is, everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But I only wrote slow to anger on it, because that's all I could fit. <laughs> For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, you can have righteous indignation, righteous anger. I mean, John the Baptist displayed it. Uh, and you brood of vipers, you know. Uh, Jesus uh, did it twice with the making a cord of whips and casting out the money changers. But to just get angry in the flesh, this is what he's talking about, the spirit versus the flesh and what comes out of our mouth. You know, we're speaking blessings and curses, and that shouldn't be. You know, we should be able to, to be careful with what we're saying, control that. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is to save your souls. But prove yourselves of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. This is about being hearers and doers. And this is, all fits in with faith and works. That's why we jumped ahead to that. So, um, you know, I go to church, I, I participate at church, but most people, and this is not being judgmental, uh, there's an 80-40 rule, and some people say in the church it's probably more like 90-10, um, meaning 90% of the congregation, um, they may give some money in the, you know, the pot if it's passed around or in the donation uh, boxes, but uh, they don't do anything. Maybe they'll say a prayer or two, but for the most part, they don't do anything. Uh, they don't help at all. Uh, so the 10% does 90% of the work and 90% do, you know, they don't, they don't do anything. And, you know, that doesn't mean they're not saved, but this is where the power of the Holy Spirit comes in and being a, a hearer and a doer, right? So we should be hearing and then doing. For anyone, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is or what he looks like. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does." If anyone thinks himself to be religious, or meaning a Christian, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's faith, or the, sorry, this man's religion is worthless, or this man's Christianity is worthless. So again, it gets back to the two topics we're hitting on here. Faith it produces works and our tongue. So it starts with, we're hearing, right? We're seeing, two eyes to see, Two ears to hear, one mouth in unison, speaking out, right? So that's what we're supposed to be learning about here. Pure and undefiled religion, or you could say Christianity, in the sight of our God and Father is one to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So then it goes on to talk about not being partial or prejudiced, and uh, then it, he, he goes, continues to go on about... Um, if you sin in one area, you've sinned in all of the areas. And uh, then, of course, talks about faith and works. And we can go on with that another time. But that's very valuable, very important teaching. Uh, it's something I will like to revisit because our, our, our faith, it, you know, yes, it's not all just about being kind and respectful, uh, but it is, too. Um, am I quick to blow the horn? Am I quick to, you know, uh, get upset with somebody? Uh, do I talk poorly or badly about others? Uh, when I see that there is some type of need, do I want to go to meet it? Or do I want to just uh, throw up a prayer and go, well, God will send somebody. Well, you know, I, I can't do everything. So this is where you, you, the importance of having that relationship with the Holy Spirit really matters. Because if you put that time and effort into that relationship with God, right? 
you're going like that. So he's filling you up. You use that Holy Spirit filter through your head, through your heart, through your mouth. You'll know, well, I, I should give to that. I should participate in that. I should uh, emphasize that, talk about this or encourage this ministry. And But where, where should you give and where should you help? And that will become clear to you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the rapture and where it is in the Bible and why there's some denominations that literally teach it does not exist and many other denominations kind of ignore it. And it, I would say the main reason is because it is a very spiritual thing. It's literally the entrance of Jesus uh, coming out of another dimension and pulling us into that dimension. It's kind of something out of like Marvel movies with Doctor Strange or, uh, and, uh, or what we saw with No Way Home with Spider-Man. And it's very interesting because... Uh, it fits in with some wild ideas like Genesis 6 and the Nephilim with fallen angels. Again, a Marvel movie, things like, with like the Nephilim and there were the, uh, what, there were the, uh, the deviants, right? And you call it Loki the variants. <laughs> and how does that all connect? Well, one is fake, one is comic book, it's entertainment, and it's pulling a bit from the Bible because the Bible is the most influential book on the planet. But there is a reason for the rapture. The reason for the rapture and the reason for the teaching of the rapture is God wants us to be comforted by the idea of when we get near those last days, as we see and discern by the power of the Holy Spirit, know the signs of the times, right? We've read the Bible, we know it, we pray, we ask for the Holy Spirit. We see these things lining up, right? Like, I, I never figured out how could anyone, how could there be a mark of the beast? You know, how is people going to get that? I mean, whether they're going to just line up and get this computer chip in their arm or their forehead or, you know, this, they're going to just get scanned. Well, now we see that how this could happen. We, we've seen worldwide peace. Some places you, you can't buy it or sell unless you have been able to prove that you've, uh, you have a card or a chip that says certain things were done to you or you have to wear a mask. So we could see this, this is leading towards that. We could jump back a little further. Some of the things that went on with Hitler and the restoration of Israel. These are things that are leading towards uh, the, the end time events and they're gonna be bad. So the comfort is that we are not condemned or judged. We are the righteousness of God. So we are going to be removed. And part of the reason we're removed is because the church comes up, and, and uh, I'll admit, for the most part, as a Christian, I have not been really persecuted that much, uh, made fun of, um, talked bad behind my back, um, maybe a little bit of vandalism or something to my home or car or mailbox, minimal. But there's people who have literally uh, lived in poverty, uh, isolation, persecution, hatred towards them and, uh, and, and been beaten repeatedly, stolen from, and, and some have given their lives uh, throughout time over this world by persecution towards them. And some by people who, who were also uh, you know, called Christians but may have not been truly believers or may have been deceived. But uh, there's going to come a time where all this persecution that was done to God's children, there's payback time. And it's going to get really bad towards the end times. And God's going to take his people off and then bring his wrath down. And during that time period, there's going to be a lot of people getting saved. Um, there's still grace and mercy in that time, even though there's judgment and condemnation. So we have the most famous verse, of course, is of Thessalonians. I believe it is. Yeah. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up meaning harpazo in Greek or raptimur in Latin, together with him in the clouds, rather with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And so that's, these are the verses that talk about the rapture, which is meant and given to us as a comfort. And there's some other verses here. I tell you, 
on that night, there will be two in one bed. So they're sleeping. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two women grinding at the mill or in the same place in the morning making bread. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two men will be in the field, that's in the daytime. One will be taken, the other will be left. That's in Luke 17, 34 through 36. So this is describing a worldwide event that happens at a certain time and some people will be sleeping, some will be, it'll be different times throughout the day. And, and this is just an example, one will be taken, one will be left. That's not literally, I mean, if your whole family's Christian, your whole family's gonna be taken. But if you're in a household where one person is or you're working in the field and your partner is a believer and uh, you're not, you're, you're gonna be left. And I've heard teachings um, that it was the opposite. The one left, you see, that's the one who's the Christian. See, because God's setting up heaven on earth and he's taking all the, and I'm like, oh, that doesn't work. When you, you see, when, if you take these things and isolate them and then just build around it, you can come up with all sorts of ideas. But if you look at the Bible from, the, from Genesis to Revelation, you, you come up with these ideas. There's this discussion, this discussion of there's going to be an end times and there's going to be a tribulation, right? There's going to be some bad things happening and it's going to last for a period of time. It's mentioned in Daniel, the, the uh, last uh, of the 79 weeks, the 70 weeks in Daniel, the last, the last week. And this gets poured out onto the earth. That's an example there. There's quotes in Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel, of course. I'm not mentioning all this. We don't have time for all this. And there's, of course, Matthew 24. But the thing to remember in this whole thing with, with the, the rapture and the idea of the rapture is it's a, it's a spiritual event where Jesus himself steps into our realm and pulls us out, right? John in Revelation he, he looks up, sees the doors open in heaven, right? The door is open and he's all of a sudden he's in heaven with the church. And that's an event where we're taken up as his beloved, right? The bride of Christ. We're not, we haven't had the, the wedding supper yet. That comes at the end when he comes back and we go back with him. But we're up in heaven and there's a place being prepared for us up there. And we see and we're kind of, piecing together what's happening down here on earth. We're kind of watching it as spectators, almost like from a, from a blimp looking down. And we see all these cool things kind of happening. And you think, oh, that's so sad. Say, well, I mean, it is, but you can't have heaven on earth and you can't have earth in heaven if you still have sin and you still have people who refuse to believe and it, they wouldn't come under grace and love and mercy. So there'll be a whole lot of people who come and they bow their knee just because they now realize, whoa, Jesus is right. And those people who are all gone, raptured, were Christians. And they'll come begging mercy. And unfortunately, they'll, many of them will be martyred because there'll be uh, uh, you know, a lot of evil going on a lot. Well, even while this wrath is coming from God, there's still people who are bad are rising up and being worse. So, but that's not something that should get any of us upset. What it should bring us the realization is, is that we have things to do here. And yes, we have our callings with our job and our, we have our hobbies, but in all of that, we can glorify God. And then outside, above and beyond that, we should pray about what ministry are we supporting? Are we supporting with money, with time, with both? Are we somehow helping them with our skills? You know? So these are things to think about. Okay, I'll sign off now. In Jesus' name, amen.